During Catherine's time as mistress at Chenonceau, it was the scene of many brilliant festivities, like the one to welcome her son, the young King Francois II, and his wife Mary Stuart. He was 14 when he married, 15 when he was crowned, and not quite 17 when he died of meningitis. Chenonceau saw even more spectacular celebrations for the succession of his brother, Charles I. On this occasion, as the guests arrived, nymphs emerged from these woods to greet them, and mermaids rose singing from the moat. Later, there were banquets and dances and masquerades and fireworks, and even a mock naval battle here on the River Cher. But outside the chateau gates, there were the ordinary people, their lives untouched by the splendours of court. I somehow doubt that the nobility had any idea what it was really like to get their hands dirty labouring in the fields, but they sang or listened to any number of songs on the subject. Here's one, for instance, about Margot working in the vineyard. That was a charming little song, but it portrays Margot, I'm afraid, merely as the ripe target for an amorous adventure, and nothing more. No, the nobility's view of agriculture at that time was rather more like this. This is the Renaissance garden, which has been lovingly reconstructed at Villandry. Even the vegetables have been planted in geometrical patterns, and of course latecomers to Europe, like the potato, are not included. Something of the garden's tranquil beauty is reflected in this next song, Triste des Par, The Sadness of Parting. It's by Nicolas Gombert, one of the most accomplished French polyphonists. The poem tells how the sadness of parting had filled me with sorrow. My body was colder than marble, run through with grief and withering as a tree. My face had lost all its colour.
of all the produce earned through labour of the fields, the one that's most universally praised in song is without doubt the fruits of the vine. And the Loire Valley produces its share of fine vintages. They can be sampled in the many carves that line the river banks. At Vouvray, we were invited into one of these limestone grottos to savour their famous crisp white wines. That piece was by Orlandus Lassus, whom we'll meet again during the series. But sadly, that brings us to the end of this program. And so we'll close our short tour of the Loire Valley, its numerous chateaux, and the music of 16th century France with a well-known piece by Passero, Il est bel et bon. Il est bon, 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 il est bon